Well, everyone, welcome to, and it's only Christopher Norton's face on the live stream. Excellent, it all worked. My face isn't there, but doesn't matter. Um, welcome to our first Zoom webinar of 2020. And um, our, with our, a very special welcome to Christopher Norton, who has agreed to be our star first of the year um, speaker. And today's topic is improvisation. So with no further ado, oh, if you're watching on live stream and you want to ask questions, we are watching the Facebook feed as well. You're welcome to join us in the Zoom room. We'll put the link there. But any questions you ask in the forum, I'll ask at question time at the end. So without any further ado, thank you, Mr. Norton. Um, thank you. Um, I'm speaking to you from Canada at 5 a.m. Uh, uh, so it's uh, one of those unusual <clears throat> time shifts across the whole world. Um, so uh, I'm talking about improvisation. I decided on this particular one, uh, and we we may do others, but to, to do something on the four pieces that are on the syllabus. Uh, there's something for the initial syllabus, something from grade two, something from grade seven and grade eight, uh, because the principles of, of improvisation and chord playing are similar in some ways um, across the board. And of course, I don't know what sort of range of students teachers have here, but, but I'm guessing they go from initial to grade eight. Uh, and further, so, so it'll, it'll encompass hopefully everybody who's logged on today. Um, by the way, I think I'm right in saying that Enchanted Castle is uh, the easiest piece of all. Uh, the background to this, this is from Micro Jazz Duets Collection 1. Um, for, for those of you who haven't noticed this, Micro Jazz, uh, which is the series that Intercity Stomp comes from, among other things, has now been um, around for 40 years. I actually wrote it in 1981, and it was it came out with Boozy Dogs in 1983, so it was actually 40 years old. So these pieces go right back to the early 80s, but um, they're still being used very enthusiastically by by students around the world. So so uh, what can I say? It's it's, it's surprising to me as well. Um, so uh, these particular duets they were written in 1992 because they were easier than any previous ones had been and it was decided by the publishers at the time that it was nice to have something which is a bit more straightforward. They're all about pre-grade one to grade one in difficulty. And what I thought might be quite fun is for you to see, first of all, a composer performance of this. So this is me at home playing Enchanted Castle so you can just remind yourself what this sounds like. So that's reminding you, and there are some lovely performances of, of, of my pieces on YouTube, and that's another thing, if you're trying to improvise, um, it's quite nice to kind of, to kind of get a feeling for, for the different versions of this piece which are available. This is a very nice performance of the same piece played by students. So you can see that's a very nice performance by those two boys. Um, so that's the sort of flavor of the piece. And what I'm talking about today is improvising a little bit around this piece. And just to mention the, the structure of this piece, it's got a, an eight bar opening section. And then the first four bars are repeated with that little uh, eighth note figure at the end of it. And then the B section has these stronger chords. 
it suddenly sounds much more sort of radiantly in major key. Now there are five chords uh, in this. Now when it says five chords, I don't mean number five. There are chords called five chords. <laughs> now this is rather uh, a fun thing, and that is a it's a major or minor chord with no third. In other words, this sound. Okay. It's, used, it's used in a lot of folk music, but that's something which uh, any of you, if you've got pianos in front of you, could just play uh, and, and actually get the feeling of that. I'm doubling yeah. it in my left hand, so you're actually in here with E and B in my right hand, and E and B in my left hand. So th that's the first type of chord. The second type of chord is a major chord. And the other chord, which is lovely, is a five chord with an added ninth, and that means in the key of E and F sharp and if, if you crush it against the E you get this sound it's a lovely sound that's E F sharp B so I, I've got a picture of the chords coming up uh, here we go so there's E5 and then there's D5 I'm going to play them one at a time so you can see them on screen now as well when I play D5 C D E5 at 9. Now already this is quite um, a, a rich effect and I think one of the things I'd say uh, to any of you, I've given you a worksheet for this as well, is that you just get to, to know the individual chords, just each one at a time, enjoy the flavour of each chord and get fluent with playing each chord. Because what happens then is you can actually play the chords of the piece with the piano recording. Now, now the, the, the piano recording is available on YouTube, obviously, and I think it's also, if it isn't already, it's about to be on all digital platforms. But there's also a backing track for this as well. But I'm suggesting that you can actually, with two pianos, if you can do it, have the students play a duet and the teacher play the chords or vice versa. So the chord chart for this piece, That's fine. And then C, D, and then this lovely E5. Little section. And it ends with the E5 at 9. So that, I think I've supplied you with, but that, that is a lovely... Um, little chord progression it's quite unusual because uh, as you can see it, it it has major chords in it and the rest of the chords are these open chords uh, and if you're trying to improvise on a piece like this you, you know it's an e and i i've put in the notes about this myself it's e natural minor now this is um an e minor scale with it with a d natural So there's only one sharp, the F sharp, otherwise it's all white notes from E to E. So again, doing simple improvisation with this piece, that scale will work very nicely. So play the chords of the piece with the recording. Now, I think this is the recording that you're about to hear. Oh yeah. So that's a very good little exercise already. What I suggest you do now is you play freely with the chords, and I just tried this out myself, is what you take the chord and you break them up into patterns. I've got a new figure coming up.
So that's the first thing you can try improvisation wise is actually take those those chords and just arpeggiate them in various ways, making little figures out of them. So you're actually uh, effectively creating a, a, a vamped accompaniment, you might say, using these very sparse chords. So that's a really good exercise. It's not too hard, I think you'll agree, to do. And then uh, that's about it for now. I'm just going to go back on that screen quickly because, oh, that's Intercity Stomp. If you had that playing, somebody else playing that, so this is using the two duet partners and tried actually doing some improvisation. I'm just going to play the left hand chords. I'm making little melodies up there using that E natural minor scale with the left hand chords only playing as an accompaniment. So that's a very simple device which you could try with students to say to them you're going to use the notes E, F sharp, G, A, B, C, D, E maximum, any order and any direction and any octave as well. Um, but the left hand, you'd follow the left hand chords as they're written there and you can play this with the backing track or you can play it with the piano part online so you can actually have an accompanying going of the entire piece so that's that's some simple but i think easily sort of applied um suggestions for doing simple improvisation on these rather mysterious chords of this first piece so now i'm going to go on to grade two and oh yes there's breaking up into the pads so don't, don't forget you can break these up into all those kinds of patterns there and that's just an example on screen for you to see now, Intercity Stomp <clears throat> is one of the most popular pieces I've written, as you probably know. And this is from 1981, so it goes way back, and from Microjazz Collection 2. Uh, and this has originally was supported by MIDI files, which in fact are now available in a different format um, via the medium of Superscore, which is an iPad app, which has uh, lots of my books on it as well. But the backing tracks are all available online now. If you look at my name on Spotify or on iTunes or whatever, my publishers have actually released all the backing tracks uh, on all mediums. So you can actually stream the backing tracks for this. If, you, if you're playing the piece, you can just have a listen and get a, getting a feel for this style. But also the backing tracks are very good for, to, for improvising on. Now, here's me playing Intercity Stomp. And I recorded this a long time ago. I think it's back in the late 80s, but uh, you'll see my hands anyway. Now, students really like that piece because it's uh, it's all in one mode and has the kind of stamping left hand and that's a very good opportunity to do some improvisation uh, using that stomping left hand. Now I just thought it was a bit of fun. This is a student on YouTube playing a, a rather different version of this but I, th I thought this had a lot of personality as well. Start. lovely. Now um, you've noticed that there are two chords basically in this piece, or two main chords. It's obviously G minor and there's an E flat chord as well. 
And so the piece keeps jumping between G and E and an E flat of some kind. We're going to look into that in a second. Now, this has got an A section with a surprise missing beat at the end of it, which is quite fun. Um, and then the it, it repeats up an octave, and then the last four bars are repeated with a diminuendo. So so you get that do 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 getting softer and softer. And then a very mysterious ending. These chords built in fourths. So it's G C F in your right hand. D G C in your left hand. And the only pedal in the piece as well. And then you've got the final little figure. Now, the rhythmic style was influenced by Michael Jackson's Beat It. Do 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 do. Da, 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 just beat it. And I, I hadn't realized until years later when I had a backing track done that in fact that's where it's sprung from was Michael Jackson of all things. So it's definitely a rock beat. Uh, now the chords used in this, this is rather interesting. Um, I find it quite interesting and you could do the same thing. It's again, if you listen to the piece or have someone play the piece and play chords underneath that you, th you find that you think sound right. I, I thought the G chord was actually a G minor 7, which sounds like this. And then the second chord, E flat 13. And of course that unusual chord at the end. So you can tell straight away this piece is quite jazzy and um, the use of a minor 7th chord, a 13th chord and a D minor 11 is amazing really considering the students of uh, eight, seven or eight years old are playing this piece not realizing they're actually playing quite jazzy harmonies in, in terms of the background harmonies to the piece. Now the voicings, I just wanted to talk about this briefly because this is something which really comes into improvisation a lot and that is the opening chord is a G minor chord of sorts and a G minor seven chord has an F added to a G minor chord like that and a typical jazz voicing is the one that I've got uh, on the right there. You've got the seventh of the chord in your thumb of your right hand. So here's G sharp minor seven, G minor seven. I'm, I'm just doing that same chord shape and moving it up a, a semitone. So you might like to even try that as a little exercise as well. Then you've got the E flat chord. Here's an E flat major chord. And then E flat seven, which you'll all know. But the 13th is where you have the sixth note of the scale, which is a C, added to the ninth note of the scale, which is an F, on top of that chord, and you get this sound. Or, I've cr crushed them all together there, so that's an E flat 13, where I'm playing E flat in my left hand, and then G, C, D flat, F, which is a lovely chord. And again, I'm shifting it up and down uh, half steps there. And then the final chord, of course, is this thing called D minor 11. So these are the only chords in this piece. And that's why it's quite fun to actually look at this piece um, as a little chord study. Uh, but what I'm going to suggest you might do in terms of improvisation is this. You play the piece up to bar 20. Now, there, there's what it looks like, the piece up to bar 20, and you can see it gets to the end of um, bar 19 and 20, you get... And what you do is keep those Gs going. Now, you can see from the tune, that's already sounds like a particular scale, and in fact, that, that is the G minor pentatonic scale. And if you moved to an F above that, and a G above that, there's the G minor pentatonic scale. And a lot of uh, pop music, a lot of soul music, a lot of R&B uses pentatonic minor. And this is no exception. So if you were going to keep those Gs going, You can see even when it goes down to the E flat, you can keep that scale going. So that's the first thing you can get a student to do, just completely freely play the G's in the left hand, because it's quite nice to keep that um, simple one note accompaniment going. And try just making up little melodies using the G minor pentatonic scale, starting with just 
first few notes, but expanding it so you end up with the F. And of course, you can then add little grace notes. But you get the idea. So um, that is, without any backing track or anything, that is a great way of kind of getting started. And then on the next page, this, by the way, is from a book called Improvised Micro Jazz. And uh, it, you might not know about this, but it, it is, it is um, still available. And it, it has little improvisation su suggestions for lots of pieces from micro jazz and just to stomp as one of them. So going here to some ideas where you can answer a two bar phrase with another two bar phrase. So the, um, I'm just having a two bar phrase answered by another one. So I'm just gonna try this myself. Yeah, so you can see the idea is a repeated idea, and the second one. So that's a very simple principle, but it's a lovely one, and that is you you have the same idea repeated three times, and then you answer the fourth time with a slightly different idea in the same rhythm. It doesn't have to be the same rhythm, but it works quite well, as you can tell. So I'm going to try a couple of those myself. So so let's have another one. Okay, now I'm kind of going a little bit freer there, but you get the idea. You can do a two-bar phrase, but in fact, a lot of students like I'm doing, they start to get the idea and that they like to play freely. And I think that's quite good to almost say, go as long as you can. I mean, I mean, let's just keep that going and, and see how it feels. But one thing that's just really exciting, of course, which uh, I haven't mentioned, is you could actually say to them, at, at a certain point, if you feel it's appropriate, move to the E-flat and then back to the G again. So you're gonna get this. So, on. so this piece lends itself very well to free improvisation of this kind, where you're actually using just that stomping left hand and perhaps moving to the E flat. Now, a second thing you can do, you, you can answer uh, each thing with your own tune altogether. So I've got on the music here uh, on the screen, and again, this is in your worksheet. Uh, you play an idea which I give you. And what I've done there, this is interesting, do you notice the scale here has got F, G, A, B flat, C, D? Because in fact, I discovered you can use not just the G minor pentatonic scale, but also, or a G minor natural minor with an E flat or an E natural, depending on the context. If you have an E flat underneath, obviously the E natural doesn't sound so great, but the E flat sounds great. But I've given this scale for you to think about. So when you try this at home, you could, you could use that or, so in other words, starting the scale on a G or starting it on an F. So here's this question and answer. So what I've done in the exercises here is actually done something different from the piece, and that is I've done something closer to a blues progression where you actually move to the C in the left hand and then back to the G again, and that's quite nice as well. And then at the bottom of the page, it, it has completely your own thing. And you can do all sorts of things with this, but basically you've got the question and answer, so you're doing your own question and your own answer this time. So here's me doing my own question and my, uh, and my own answer. <laughs> Now, do you notice I started playing the fourth? And that is springs a little bit from the end of the piece where you've got those chords and fourths, but it sounds quite good. And so on, and also thirds, six, uh, fifths. 
So you can tell this piece lends itself to all sorts of intervals being used as well. So it's just a very fun sort of free improvisation um, opportunity where the students learn this piece, they get to the end of the first 20 vowels of the first main statement, you might say, keep those G's going, and then just say to them, just try things out, here's some suggestions, and if they need suggestions, and one of them obviously is to try and repeat ideas, because that's what I've done here, where I've got an idea, then you answer it, then the same idea that I did first, and then you answer that. Because students, the danger with improvisation is that they they can't remember anything they've done. <laughs> and, and, and in other words, they play an idea and it's forgotten immediately. What's good is to make them aware of the fact that they're probably coming up with good ideas which they could use again. And certainly Intercity Stomp uses ideas very economically. It's, it's, it's using the same ideas kind of circling round and round. So that's from Improvised Micro Jazz, and you can see it's a very simple idea. This isn't really so much talking about the chords, although I have mentioned the chords, but this is more talking about using um, a, a, a simple scale or scales over a, a, a repeated left hand uh, figure, which is just basically the, the original stomping G's from the piece. Now, I'm moving on to a third piece now, because in fact, in the time we've got, I'm actually trying to sort of talk about four pieces altogether. This is from grade seven, and it's called Pop Bossa. This is written in 1995, it's in the Latin Preludes collection, and it's used all around the world on examination boards, uh, but um, the Associated Board has picked up on the Pop Bossa from the Latin Preludes collection uh, in, the, in the latest syllabus, so it's great. I mentioned the Superscore app on the screen here. Again, the Latin Preludes collection is on it, and you can be playing those in an interactive domain and play them slower because you can slow the whole thing down with the backing track slowed down as well. You can also remix it so you've got just a piano or just a piano right hand. So do look into that as well if you've got an iPad because it's a free app and you can then download the uh, collections like the Latin Preludes collection inside it. So that's what the cover looks like. And it's an easygoing eight beat Latin rock style. And the basic drum beat of the piece looks like this. Now this is an interesting other way of approaching improvisation on my piece is that you can take the original drum feel and start with that. So if you just look at that, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm just tapping this on my knees here. Boom, 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 ba, boom, 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 ba, ba, boom, jack, boom, boom, ba, boom, 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 ba, ba, boom. So you can see it's not too hard a pattern to get, but it is quite an intriguing one. Uh, so try tapping the pattern above. Uh, you're using your left hand and your left leg for the bass drum. So it's just um, basically a quarter note and then eighth note rest and eighth note. Uh, so it's that. And then the right hand, the rim part is, is, is your right hand and your right leg. And so on. And do this with the drum tracks applied. Oh, it's quite quick. Now that drum part is actually from the MIDI file, which is inside Superscore. So you can actually you can actually make the drums play by themselves on that particular medium. Anyway, you've got the picture of the thing on the screen there. You can even get a couple of students to do the drum part, or you could tap it out and then get improvisation on that. So there's that. So think about the idea of working with the drum pattern and keep the speed going in your head when you play the piece, because that is really a great way to kind of get into the whole feel of the piece. Because a lot of the time when you're improvising, it's in particular grooves, it's in particular fields, if you like, and each one has its own world. Now here's the piece, by the way, played by the composer, so I thought I'd just remind you what this sounds like for those of you who don't know this.
So that's uh, in itself already quite an improvised sounding piece. It's got lots of jazz voicings. And let's just have a look at the rhythmic style it has that beat referred to earlier. And the piece has is, is got a, a strict beat going right through to the end. The first section uh, is immediately repeated down, with, uh, repeated down an octave on the right hand. So you basically got the, the f first idea and then it's repeated. Um, and then the B section ventures further away from the original key. And then a, that very rhythmic rising figure leads to a restatement. And it's broken up with six, eight bars. So there's all sorts of interesting things happen in this piece. So just learning the piece is teaching you quite a lot about improvising in this kind of style. The backing track, of course, really spells it out. And I'd like to talk about the chords of this for a start. So th this is quite interesting because it's not very complicated. So you've got this. There's F major 7 and then G minor and G minor over C. So again, that's a very different world, isn't it, from the uh, first two pieces we've been looking at. It's got, it's got that whole kind of... Uh, Latin music often has, has major 7th and major nine chords, which, which are kind of central chords. They're, they're like the, the, the effect of a chord, if you like, in itself. So if you've got a piano in front of you again, it's worth just playing those chords, because you can see they're pretty easy. And then, I've said here, play them till they feel automatic, because what you can do, if you're playing with the backing track, or, you, or you've just been listening to the backing track, you can do this. Now, just play around with those two chords in a, in a rhythmic feel, which sounds like it fits with the track. And that's a very good little exercise, improvisation-wise, immediately. Now, what I've done here, which is quite fun, is just the first section of this piece. And what I did was I took the backing track, and by the way, again, on SuperScore, you can do this. I think with some digital uh, audio programs, you can do this with the backing track as well. But basically, I've, I've cut the backing track at bar 8 and repeated it. So you get this chord progression. And that's quite fun. So you've got a stop in bar seven, and then you've got this little figure as well. In jazz uh, sort of situations, if you like, quite often that happens, and that is you're not just playing chords, but you have to actually join the group for certain units and figures or for stops. And so this is a good little exercise for that. Now, I'm going to play the track with us now, I think. This backing track, I think we're going to make sure you have this available to you um, after the session. We'll be posting it up in the chat, so, you, so you'll definitely have this available to play with. So that's a good start. You notice I was just making rhythms up, and that's a great little exercise. You can also break the, the arpeggios up. So, on. so you can tell it's quite easy to try and, and sort of break the chords up into to one note and two notes or into arpeggios like I just did. And that's another improvisation thing which students were well advised to do. Learn this very simple chord progression and then try and just do simple variations on it using arpeggiation or breaking the chords up into broken chords. Now, trying your own chord rhythms with the track is what I've been doing. So there's another picture of the track, but now you can imagine you can actually uh, play it. Uh, the backing track. So listen to the track now and imagine the chords, the rhythm that you might play. I started doing improvisation there and 
I realize I'm using the major pentatonic scale because it's a funny thing to say, but in my music, major key pieces often the, the major pentatonic scale will work. That's F, G, A, C, D, F. Uh, in a minor key piece like Intercity Stomp, the minor pentatonic scale will often work. So bear that in mind as a starting point that I'm quite a pentatonic composer. Um, you might say a lot of the music I write springs from folk roots, which is often pentatonic. So th that's uh, just some suggestions to do simple chord rhythms with the track. Now the next thing is there's a bass pattern in there, which is on the backing track, and I wrote out the track that is the bass part that's actually playing, and this is what it sounds like. So I'm jamming away there on the pentatonic major scale and doing sort of simplified version of that bass part. So you can actually play, accompany yourself with the kind of bass pattern as well, which is quite fun. And then the other thing, which is amazing, there are left hand chords in this piece, which are actually written in the music, which are very jazz. And look at these chords. And I'm just going to play them by themselves for a start. And they, they keep all saying, and then. Now that looks fine, but if you actually then play that with the track, That was interesting because I started doing, I started playing rhythms in my left hand, which sort of bounced against against the tunes I was playing in my right hand. That's very jazz. You can tell it's a very jazz sound. And if you listen to jazz players, I can think of lots of them you could refer to. Um, the one that immediately springs to mind is Brad Mieldow, for instance, the American jazz player. They have wonderful uh, use of left hand chords and left hand rhythms. So. Um, that's quite a fun thing to have. You've got it in your worksheet again to, to just play with those chords. Now, what are these chords, by the way? That's an F major chord, because don't forget the opening chords were F and G minor 7. The opening chord is F, A, D, so it's F, obviously. Then you've got a D, which is actually a sixth. And then you've got a G, which is a, a ninth. So this is a, a major 9, 6 chord, or 6, 9, they usually call it. Major 6, 9. So that's F69, and then the second chord is a G minor chord with an A in it. And that's the ninth, so it's a minor nine chord. So I'm just mentioning those, those terms. You can tell though, they're, they're lovely crunchy chords, and, and all the notes can seem to logically go from one to the next chord as well. So that's worth knowing about as well. Now, here's a whole lot of right hand ideas to try with the left hand chords. I've got these on your worksheet, and this is amazing when you look at this. So you've got the original tune. So that's that. Now, changing rhythm. Add grace notes. making them sound a bit strange there, but you get the idea. And then add mordants. Change the notes. Add extra notes. Change articulation. You can't read this print very well, but it's basically it's combining all this stuff. So you can see there's lots of things you can do with your right hand just using those two chords. Um, if I just go back a screen, I think I'm right, I can do this. 
uh, that's gone too far, hang on a minute, is the bass part. Here are the chords. Yeah, it's using these chords in your left hand and doing all these right hand devices with the chords. That is a very, that's like a little compendium of, of improvisation things you can try out. Um, original tune, changing the rhythm, grace notes, mordens, changing the notes, adding extra notes, changing the articulation, and then combining them all madly in one compendium, if you like. So that's Pop Bossa from grade seven. Now, that, by the way, is my grandson in Toronto, and he's, uh, I think, just on grade three piano. Um, and in fact, I think he did Intercity Stop when he did grade two as well. So there you go. But uh, this is Jingo from grade eight. So this is the most complicated piece, which I'll be talking about during this little session. But again, it has lots of things which actually are quite um, useful in general terms. Uh, this has 14 rock styles. This also is on SuperScore. It has backing tracks and MIDI files. Um, and here's a composer performance. I won't show you the whole thing, but there's a very good student performance on YouTube, which I discovered recently. And so yeah, I do hear some excellent student performances of this piece. Here's the beginning of this play by, not by me, but by a student. So do seek that out because that's a really good performance. Okay, now this isn't C minor, and you've guessed the scale that's used is pretty much all uh, C minor pentatonic. So this scale here, uh, and it has that repeated idea um, at the beginning, and then you got the main idea, which is the fast one. That one. And the ragtime left hand, so that's it's a very fast moving right hand melody leading to syncopated chords, these ones, which is a, a really useful thing to know about as well if you're doing improvisation. And then it's answered by a new very syncopated 60s note ideas as punctuations. Um, dee, 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 dee. And so on. And um, so it's full of excitement, this piece, but it's all very much rooted in C minor pentatonic. So that's just a quick look, look at the structure of the piece, uh, the development. Uh, it moves to F for the first time in the middle section, then goes back to C again, uh, and finishes at the extreme ends of the piano. It's, a, it's a rather exciting to try and play something with a 16th note syncopation at the very end. So here are the chords used in Jingo. Now these are really unusual. Have a look at this. Look at that. E flat 6 add 9, C7 sus 4, C minor 7, C minor 11, C minor 9 over F and D minor 11 over C. Now I'll play these one at a time on my piano here. That sounds rather nice. That's E flat 6 add 9, C7 sus 4, D minor 7, D minor 11, D minor 9 over F, and D minor 11 over C. 
So those are worth just playing around with just, just to get the feel of those because you could end up, I think, make up a lovely piece, a free piece. I'm just basically freely playing the, the, over the chord, uh, not, not even a chord progression, but just over the individual chords there. So, but when you string them all together, you'll notice the chords are neither major nor minor uh, any of the time. They're using suspended notes and added notes to create pungent, striking sonic effects. That's rather well put, isn't it? Um, the basic drum beat used in Jingo looks like this. This is a very different drum beat from the first one. Again, I picked this up from the MIDI file. So let's see what this sounds like. And so on. So that, that's a useful pattern. You've got that in your notes again. Use the drum beat to help create ideas in this very specific style. Now, if I just go back uh, on that screen once, once again, I'm just going to play that. Here we go. Just creating little ideas there using that drum pattern. Now, funnily enough, Jingo was written with a Yamaha drum machine back in 1987, which had a pattern on it called Jingo. So I was actually using that drum pattern as a starting point for the piece. So you can get students to actually take a drum pattern like this and try and make their own piece up, if you like. Just, just, and I'm, I'm just doing that. And again, I'm. An inverted chord of G, C minor seven, B flat, C B flat, and then I'm I'm actually playing rhythms between my hands and chords. So the, the 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 right hand's playing F G B flat C. I think is the chord I'm using there. But I'm just playing kind of blocky rhythmic things. It's a very much a funk style as this one. So use the drum beat to help create ideas in this very rhythmic style. Now, simple improvisation on Jingo, play the left hand pattern that goes on the main theme. This is this. It's not that easy to play. Okay, so just 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 trying to get that going. And then the right hand uses the C minor pentatonic scale. Okay, so I, I'm I'm doing little sort of riffy things using the C minor pentatonic scale against that left hand. Now that's a very simple exercise, but it's a very useful one. And again, if the student has played the piece, you can actually just say, let's just try that. We just keep that left hand pattern going as long as you like, and just mess around with the right hand and see if you can get things going, because it helps you play the piece better as well, I think. Uh, and also as a spur, obviously, to creating your own pieces. So try purely rhythmic ideas using initially only C, then C and E flat, then C, E flat, and F. In other words, build the scale up a note at a time. So, so I'm going to just show you that. So you can tell straight away it's giving a good shape of the improvisation there. We're actually starting with one note and then adding the next note, then the next one. Try in different directions, repeated notes, chords made from the scale, go crazy. So this is a really fun thing to actually kind of just do really free things with. So these, by the way, are available um, effectively from ChristopherNorton.com. Um, wherever you are, uh, that's a good starting point. That's Boozy and Hawks' page for me. Uh, the, there's the books that, that which I've talked about during this little demonstration. And here's a picture of me at the end. So uh, I'm stopping my sharing now because, in fact, I've left it enough time for um, feedback, questions, or whatever. Um, Sarah.
Over to you, I so think. There, there's a question in the in on Facebook, and I actually answered it, but then then I saw your next piece and thought maybe I answered it wrong. So the question was, why did you use a ninth chord instead of using a sus two? And I responded that it was um, functional harmony versus um, the, the guitar chords. But then in the second last piece you used a sus4 as well as a ninth chord. Yeah, so yeah. maybe your reasoning is different to what I assume. I'm not sure it's reasoning so much. I think the fact is uh, if you play certain chords like uh, I, the one, what I call C sus9, uh, obviously it sounds like a second because you've got the D right next to the C. But in fact, if you try and play it into a program, there are a number of programs you can play um, online, I've come across quite a few and they're good, where you play chords and it identifies the chord and nearly always calls it an added nine chord. So I've just, just gradually moved over to that thinking it's quite useful to think of that as a ninth, uh, which is crushed against the, uh, the first note of the scale rather than playing it way up there. Because most of the time jazz voicings, as they call them, are done because people are lazy. They don't want to stretch their hand too far. So, so the, you discover jazz players always like to crush notes together that are next to each other. Uh, I hope that's an explanation. But uh, there, there's obviously more than one way of doing it. But when I put, uh, I use some alias, and when I put um, something like a C sus2, it brings it up like it doesn't recognize the chord type. But if I put add nine, it does. So, so it's partly that, I think. Just it looks neater than, than, of it. So I've ended up drifting towards add nine as opposed to um, add two. Uh, it's interesting though, isn't it, how, how many chord types there are in those four pieces. And in fact, the opening piece had all those bare chords, which I've always liked, that, uh, and those bare chords with an added ninth or an added second. Uh, and then you've got um, the second piece, Intercity Stomp, had minus seven chord and a thirteenth chord. And again, thirteenth chords. <laughs> It's a, it's a lovely sound. I'm, I've, I've used those all my life, and, and um, that's crushing all the notes together very nicely because, in fact, the 13th is the C of an E flat chord, but the seventh of the chord is a D flat, and they're next to each other. So you get that crunchy sound because you've got that um, semitone clash, if you like, in the middle of the chord. But, but my pieces, uh, I've, and I've chosen the Associated Board ones for this particular session lend themselves very well to chord, to playing around with chords. And often, in fact, there's a, there's a sort of gag which I, I use quite often, which I'll tell you again. And that is somebody once said to me, why don't you put chord charts on your pieces? And I said, because I don't want people to find out how few chords I use. <laughs> but it's, it's not the fact that there are a lot of chords. It's the fact that they're actually um, used in a particular way, if you like. And, 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 and I think Intercity Stomp is a great example of that because it's only using two chords, but every time I've had professional jazz players play Intercity Stomp with me, they tend to do a G minor nine followed by an E third 13. And in fact, when it gets to the offbeat chords, they go, which is, now what is that? See, that's D seven with a sharp fifth and a sharp nine. <laughs> Do I mean sharp fifth? Yes, I do, I think. Um, yeah, 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 because it's got an A sharp as well, as well as an F natural. So you get this. E flat 13. And, and of course, that's, 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 that's pure kind of jazz fusion from the 1970s, which is the best era for music. That's when I wrote all these pieces. So, so, um, I've I've got this from the likes of Chick Corea and Herbie Hancock and all that in a way, but also from um, funk because I, I played in a lot of sort of R and B and soul bands in in my youth, and uh, they they have all these kind of crunchy jazz harmonies in the middle of what is basically a groove, and th that I think is is at the is at the wellspring of a lot of what I do I think. So anyway, so when students are trying to improvise around my pieces, if you like, I'm suggesting just taking simple little elements. And, and, and play around with them like this. In other words, don't try and improvise across the whole piece, but ju just take a, an aspect of the piece, like two chords and, or, or a stomping left-hand G, and just have a little bit of a messing around and assume that if it's minor key, that you can start with the minor pentatonic. If it's a major key, you can start with the major pentatonic. That's a good starting point. And in fact, excuse me if you've heard this before, but it is still one of my favorite stories, and that is when I was in a band 
way back in the 1970s, I had a very fine lead guitarist who could improvise brilliantly. And I said to him one day, I said, what's your secret? You know what I mean? Because I couldn't, what's your secret in terms of your improvisation? And he put two fingers up and said, two secrets. And I thought, here it is. Here's, here's a secret to it. Here's a secret to the universe. And I said, what are the two secrets? And he said, major pentatonic and minor pentatonic. And it's true. I mean, in other words, he was pretty much playing minor pentatonic or major pentatonic, depending on the context, as, as his default scales. So I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that's a, that's a thing you do all the time, but it is a good starting point for my stuff. It's worked for all the pieces we've looked at today. And, and I did wonder while you were talking, when you improvise or compose, do you um, plan the chord plan first? Or do you improvise and let the chord plan evolve all by itself while you're composing? It's kind of a it's a blend of the two, I would say, um, uh, because I'm quite melody driven. So, so I tend to, to be writing melody, but then at the same time, I'm, I'm sketching out what the harmonic framework might be. And I also like to catch myself by surprise and think, oh, I can I can hear a chord here. I don't know what it is or why I've done it, but let's try that. Uh, and even now, I'm still kind of exploring um, quite quite uh, wildly, if you like. And uh, I'll just share my screen one more time, if I may, because what I, what, I, what I thought might be quite fun is just to show which I've just been doing, because I'm writing stuff still all the time. Uh, hang on a minute, go to music here. You can see my screen. Uh, so, here we go. Look at this. So this is an, a, something called the Bulgarian Suite. It's about to come out through 80 days, my own company, but, but it's basically using old Bulgarian folk music and, and scales. And um, uh, what I'm saying is that that students can do as well is you don't necessarily need to go with the same scales or chord patterns all the time. You can say, let's start with something with a non-standard scale as a starting point. So. Uh, that was quite fun because, in fact, I had a Bulgarian concert pianist who said, I'd like a, a suite of pieces based on Bulgarian folk songs. And I've done it, but it, you notice that piece has also got that kind of funky uh, uh, overtones as well. <clears throat> in other words, it's it's related to, to Jingo a little bit as well, but it's using uh, uh, all these kind of Arabic scales, you might say, um, instead of the uh, um, pentatonic minor and major. Oh, have you well, disappeared? Oh, I should be here. Um, yes, I, it's it's getting late. It's probably not getting late to all our friends in the UK, but for us on this side of the world, it's, it's getting a bit bedtime. late. Yeah. Um, so um, just before we finish, does anyone have a last minute question before we farewell Mr. Norton for his to finish his, or start his day and some of us to finish ours? That's right. Or do our homework, maybe. I'm not sure in Singapore whether there's still time for homework up there. Oh, it's a question from Lorraine, is there? Yes. Mr. Norton, can you hear me? I can. All right. Okay, so I'm a semi-jazzer. I play lovely chords. Can you tell me how to free up my mind to make the right hand do what you do? You make it look so easy. Um, I can do the I, left hand chords. I can yeah. stick the ninths, elevens, minus, whatever. And all. Yeah. But I think I one of the one things right to do is, yeah, I, like I said today, is, tr is initially restrict yourself to particular scales so that you're not having to worry about that. And then what you're doing really is trying to play things which are nice rhythms against the left hand. Mm. Uh, I'm doing that. It doesn't sound like what you're doing. Um, but I, I, th I think I'm, I'm just prepared to, 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 to go for it, and I've done a lot of it. So obviously, it's, it's just a matter of the more you do, the more you, the, the more it becomes fluent. But I discovered, I've, I've discovered that with students that, in fact, if, if you say to them, "Have a go at this and play as long as you can," <laughs> it's almost like like going beyond the point where you'd normally stop. If you like, it's another thing to do. Uh, try and build the solo uh, by starting again. Think about that idea of starting with the first note of the scale and then adding the second. 
So, so don't necessarily uh, try and think of the whole thing as, as thinking I'm going to use the scale all over the place. So uh, again, <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm, I'm just deciding to start on a G there and just gradually expanding it. So, but it's very rhythmic as well. And that's what's lovely about listening to particular soloists as well. Um, um, one thing which I love, um, I'm just trying to think what it's got. Yeah, I'm just going to share my screen one last time. Am I still shared? No, I'm not. I'm just going to share my screen one last time uh, because I, I sometimes hear things. And this is another important point. Look at this. So uh, recently played. I'm just going to type it in. That's my wife's picture there, by the way. Uh, the Philadelphia Experiment. What? There we go. Philadelphia Experiment. Uh, what about this? Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> now, I'm just saying uh, on Spotify recently, I thought, oh, oh I absolutely love that. And, and um, sometimes it's worth just seeking things out and, and gr gradually amassing a Spotify playlist, if you like, which includes things which you really can relate to. Because I think it'll help, in a way, feed into your fingers if you've got things which you've heard and you thought, I, I, I like what he's doing. That's using old minor pentatonic as well, you notice that. And it's, it's wonderful use of left hand rhythms but it is definitely playing the left hand off against the right hand. So I'm just saying I'm still at, 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 um, at a stage where I, I hear things and think, oh, I love that. I'd really like to not add that to my armory, but ju ju just it's, it's part of my mental image, if you like, when I'm trying to do improvisatory things. I hope that helps. Thank you. Uh, well, by the way, Bob Rose has written very tasty bass playing. That's a bass player called Christian McBride, who, who is wonderful. And in fact, is very active on Facebook as well. So, so it, it's worth checking him out. Well, I think on that note, um, we might say farewell. Thank you, Mr. Norton, for sharing your inspiration and so many practical suggestions for how we can encourage our students and even ourselves to improvise and just get yeah, just to, just to get started in a small way with pieces you already know. That's what I'm suggesting today. And your your use of chords is very inspiring because I think with us with studying conventional harmony as per the Fuchs treatise, um, which is, or the way Bach studied, which is really what our traditional courses are doing for us for harmony. To see you there with chord one and chord two, chord one seven and two and writing a whole piece on these two chords this is not how we've learned harmony but that's re that's really ins inspiring to think outside the square so thank you for sharing yeah. that and funny enough the square is in my case is smaller than the square that bark is uh, in other words um, it's, it's less chords but <laughs> but they're, they're different types of chord and mm. uh, but that's the beauty of it i think you can learn those chords quite quickly and then think well this is a great fun to just try to play around with this no particular end in sight other than just playing around with it and, and feeling creative you know mm -hmm. so. thank you so much once again so if everyone would like to unmute i think you can <coughs> in i can invite everyone to unmute maybe or not no that didn't work oh well <laughs> we'll just say thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you so thank much you very much thank you oh, thank, thank you, you. Thank thank you. Very thank much. you. amazing <laughs> brilliant <laughs> <Cheers. Okay. Fabulous. laughs>